get started. Well, good morning. As you guys are coming in, we're excited uh, to be together. We're excited for our worship this morning. So let's stand. Let's sing together. Oh 
sisters around the world um, with all of the just discord and everything is happening that we would just spend some time praying for them. Um, so I wanted to go to the Lord this morning together. Let's pray real quick. Father God, we're thankful, Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness and the truth and the hope of the gospel, Lord. God, we ask God that you would be with our brothers and sisters um, who are in the midst of, of terrible things around the world, Lord. We pray for them in Russia and in, in the Ukraine and, and ask God that you would do what only you can, that you would be very present, um, that you would make yourself known. Um, we pray for wisdom um, in your direction and for your faithfulness, Lord. Um, we ask that, um, that the hope of the cross, Lord, um, would be something that um, all of us, um, those who are hurting and grieving, Lord, around the world would cling to um, the truth of you and who you are and the goodness of and the hope of the cross, Lord. So we want to commit that to you and ask that you be with us now as we continue um, to sing of your goodness, Lord. Should I? 
Good morning, FBN. 
How we doing? I like, I like asking that because like everybody's like, do I answer or do I not answer? And half of you are doing good today, so I'm glad about that. So if you have your Bibles, grab those and get to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you do not have a Bible, there's a black one in the seat back in front of you. Um, we're on page 1055. You'll be right there uh, with us, and that's where we want you to be able to follow along in God's Word with us this morning. I want to thank uh, Brandon, Pastor Brandon, for praying uh, for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Russia. I was thinking about that this week, just obviously, you know, the, just... If you're in Ukraine, just having, fearing for your life, fearing for your property, fearing, just all kinds of fears that are very real today and how the church can be a light in that. But also just if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus in Russia this morning and you have to walk that balance between uh, you know, being, being citizens of a government that you probably are disagreeing with at this moment and, and, and not being in a place where freedoms flow, right? And so how do they be the light? What, what kind of wisdom they'll need to be able to respond to this to their communities and their congregations? And so uh, just be praying for our brothers and sisters around the world. And it's, it's, I love mentioning that because, because the gospel is worldwide, right? The church is everywhere. And um, we have a unique, before I get into 2 Timothy 2 today, we have an awesome opportunity uh, to see Mark and Nancy Blackwell today, who have been our ministry partners for, I think they said 22 years. So 22 years, this church has supported them. So I'm gonna, they're here today, so I'm going to invite them uh, forward. I, there's a big group I can't find. There they are. Uh, so they're going to come up and just kind of introduce themselves to you, for those of you who don't know them yet. Um, and then from there, um, kind of we're going to bridge into a new opportunity they have facing them. And so Mark and Nancy, good morning. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Uh, it has been a little while since we've been back, but we're thrilled to see you, and we want to take the time just to thank you. Um, 22 plus years, that is a long time. Uh, there's a bunch of people down here that no idea, no idea how long 22 years is. Uh, we planted uh, three churches in South Africa, helped with two others, and we're right in the transition now of handing over our current church to a South African a man who's trained for ministry. And so it's a real exciting time in our lives. And we are also looking at branching or reaching up into um, the country of Zimbabwe, which is where I grew up as a boy. Um, it's um, about 22 hours to the border. We've been driving that twice a year for five years, um, reaching out into that country, doing some mission work. And there are two church plants there that we're going to be initially working with. We already have five young men who've been selected uh, who want to train for ministry, and they've started that back in September. Uh, we're looking forward to the next year and a half. Um, I said to Pastor the other day, last night, uh, you've been with us for 22. Would you stay with us for another 22? <laughs> I'm 53. I'm pretty sure I can make it to 75 or so. Um, and, uh, and whether the Lord has that in store for us or not isn't the point. The point is there's a very needy country that, that we're privileged to be able to get into. Uh, while I say that, our prayer card is at the back. Now, we're stealing some of the animal stuff to go down to the kids just now and talk to them, but afterwards we'll be back. If you want to see some of the animal stuff, you're welcome. Uh, but, but the main thing is if you have a chance to meet with us after the service, we would love that. Um, one of our goals is to train men for ministry, and Though I focus on that, I need to have my wife tell you a little bit about what she'll be doing in, in Zimbabwe. You mean the cooking part? <laughs> <laughs> cooking, washing clothes. Oh, and I'll be working with the ladies, teaching them about the Bible and uh, about how to be a pastor's wife, how to be a leader in the church, uh, to teach other ladies, to teach the kids. Um, they haven't had much training, and so that will be uh, my part of ministry there and keeping him fed and clothing, clean clothes. So the joke on the clothing is there are no dishwashers because there's no electricity, so you have to do everything by hand. And um, Nancy actually was a nurse in West Africa before we met, so she knows how to do all that. In fact, when I heard her testimony and found out that she even did the plumbing when there weren't any guys around, I was like, yeah, that's the girl for me. We won't so, have to worry about that. There is no plumbing, so <laughs> we're good. We like to make the joke that uh, the running water is there when the donkey cart that has the water on the back, when the donkeys start running, then we have running water. But um, also my new nickname for my wife is not Nancy, it's going to be Sarah, because like Abraham and Sarah lived in tents, we're going to be living in a tent as well. Um, so anyway, we have a lot more to share with you, but we're thankful for this moment, and, and thank you for praying for us. Thank you for helping us. Uh, be able to do the Lord's work or work with the Lord for the Lord there in South Africa. 
And now as we branch up into Zimbabwe, would you, would you continue to pray for us? We will stay connected to South Africa. Uh, we're one of only two missionary couples that can speak the Afrikaans language that we're aware of. We will stay tied into South Africa to do special seminars and, and to make visits there. But the bulk of our ministry is now shifting. And, uh, and it's very rural. It's a lot like your Sierra Leone group has probably just come out of. Um, and so you guys understand probably exactly what we're going to be doing. But, but thank you. And um, Lord bless you guys as, as you uh, minister here in this place differently, but with the same message uh, to the people around you. So thank you, Mark and Nancy. They've, they've got a table in the back. Uh, I want you to please uh, stop by, uh, greet them. If you have any questions about what they do, uh, they'll be there. If you don't have any questions, just thank them for their uh, service to the Lord and their commitment uh, to his kingdom. Because I don't know if you caught that, uh, but that what they just told you is what they told the, the missions team last night is that they have served in South Africa for 25 years. And, and for their last uh, 20, 25 years, whatever the Lord gives them, they're uh, they believe the Lord is calling them to now, instead of in, enjoy empty nest life, instead of just kind of take it easy, they're, they're selling a home and going to live in a tent in the rural bushes of Africa uh, to plant churches. And so uh, it's just like they're choosing the roughing it right life, you know, because there are people there that matter to the Lord that need his gospel. And so uh, their goal is to plant seven churches in the next seven years, and they already have the leaders identified, and they're going to go pour into them and launch that. And so it, it's, it's, it's a remarkable vision, a super exciting one, one that we are, we are thrilled to have a very small part in. And in that startup, um, they have uh, a lot of needs for those seven churches they want to plant. And so uh, one of the things that we're going to do today for them to try to be a blessing to them is there's a white box on the front of the sound booth. If the Lord so leads you to put some, some financial gift in there, that will go directly to them. It'll go directly to these, uh, these pastors that they're training and some needs they have in the field. Um, and so it's just a love offering, of, of our, a show of our support um, for this uh, incredible vision that they are being obedient to the Lord for. And so please do that. Please be a huge blessing to them. Encourage them. Uh, continue to pray for them. And we're so thrilled uh, to just be a small part of that. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer for them and in also in this time as, as we launch out. So let's pray. God, we thank you for Mark and Nancy. We thank you for their obedience to you um, to go uh, to places that many people would, would just shrug off as, as just not possible or not even worth it, but because they know how deeply uh, every human being matters to you, that we are all made in your image and that we all have souls and that Jesus Christ died uh, for the sins of any who believe in him. And so as they take the good news of Christ to those villages, as they pour into those people, thank you that you've given them the language skills necessary. Thank you you've given them um, just, just the, the guts necessary to, uh, to go live in a tent in the rural villages of Africa and, and, and to, to just shun all the, the comforts and securities of this modern world to just go uh, with the banner of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you would bless them, that you would uh, make their efforts successful and fruitful for the gospel, that, that many would come to know you. And Lord, as we turn our attention to your word now, I, I thank you for each person who's here today, each person who set this time aside, whether they're in this room, uh, whether they're a little one uh, being loved on right now, or whether they're somebody who's joined us online. Thank you for, um, for this moment, opportunity just to open your word, to, to speak from it. And I pray that you uh, would move, that you would convict, that you would encourage, that you would showcase your love to each and every one of us, and that we'd respond humbly to whatever you have for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name, amen. Well, I think too few people know the name William Wilberforce, and I think more should, because William Wilberforce was a, a British politician, he was a philanthropist, and in 1785, he became a follower of Jesus Christ, he gave his life to Jesus, and within a few short years after that, he was convinced by God, he was convinced that the Lord wanted him to use his position in Parliament to lead a charge to abolish the practice of slavery in England. And so he joined up with some other anti-slavery activists, and he made it like this was his lifelong career goal, right? That he was going to, to be a part of overturning this evil practice in the United Kingdom. And they succeeded. But it was not easy, right? He led a parliamentary campaign against slavery for 27 years before finally the passage of the Slave Trade Act of 1807 abolished it in England. 
And I want you to think about that. 27 years of knowing from the Lord that that you're on the right side of something. 27 years of of running in the same problems and the same issues and the same opponents and the same walls over and over and over again and not succeeding. But then he just kept going. One of his lowest points came uh, more than a decade, about 10 years into this battle, when another piece of legislation he brought to parliament received less votes than anyone previously. So it felt like he was actually going backwards. And he went home incredibly discouraged, right? And it looked like his mission to overthrow this evil practice would never work. And he was tired and frustrated and opened his Bible and began leafing through it, looking for some encouragement. And that's when a piece of paper fell out. And the piece of paper was a letter that John Wesley had written to him right before John Wesley died, knowing that he was going to take on this cause. And he read it once again. And the letter said this. William, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion, the scandal of England, and the scandal of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing, William. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. And that's exactly what he did for another 17 years, by the way, before succeeding. Now, we've been studying all all 22 and 22. We've been studying another letter that was written shortly before before someone's death. In In 2 Timothy, we have a letter from Paul who is in prison facing an execution that's more and more imminent, writing to Timothy, his protege. And so far, what we've seen in in chapter one is that Paul has concerns for Timothy after he's dead and gone. Would would Timothy stay true? Would he stay as bold and faithful to the mission after Paul's not around anymore? Or would he be like all the rest around him in the province of Asia and desert truth and desert the gospel and desert the mission? The shift in chapter two has been, it's it's a call to endurance. Chapter two has been all about endurance. Just like Wesley's letter to Wilberforce, it was a call to endurance, Chapter 2 starts with this this strong word, to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then goes to telling Timothy to multiply, ensuring that the seeds of the gospel that were sown in him would carry on long past Timothy. And then last week, Pastor Adam covered verses 3 through 7 for us, in which Paul lists three examples of endurance. A soldier who's seeking to please his officer, not concerned with civilian affairs. Right? An athlete who's only rewarded when he competes within the rules of the competition, and a farmer who is fatigued and tired and worn out and fighting the curse every day, but who gets the share of the harvest. In verse 7, Paul tells Timothy to consider these things. And Adam called us to the same, to, to pray and ask the Lord to identify where it is that he's calling us to endurance, to a long road of obedience, and then to make it a matter of prayer, and to remember the promises of God's word, to make a plan for obedience. Paul had the same things in mind when he, when he gave these examples to Timothy. And on today's passage, right, he's going to give Timothy a powerful tool for this endurance. Just as Wesley drew Wilberforce's mind back to the Lord who called him to this work, Paul will draw Timothy's mind back to Jesus, the very one who saved him, the very one who calls him, the very one who sustains him, and the one who, who by the way, walked that really long path of endurance before we ever did and then invites us to follow him. And so the one who's tired today, right, the one who wishes they would see more immediate results from their efforts from God, the one who's been tempted to settle or give in or quit, the one who's doubting that what they're doing for Christ really matters, or those who are just beaten up and exhausted, today I'm going to join with Paul and just invite you to remember Jesus. And to do so, I'm going to invite Roxanne Poe up to read today's passage. She's going to read for you uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, verses 8 through 10 is where we're going to focus. She's going to read verses 3 through 10 for context. And if you're physically capable, would you please stand with her to honor the reading of God's word this morning? Good morning, Roxanne. Good morning. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. (laughs) Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. 
Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Thank you, Roxanne. You guys can have a seat. As always, I'm going to invite you to keep your Bibles open right there to 2 Timothy 2. I'm going to unpack those three verses for you today. And I just want to level with you, right? I, I get it. Right? Chapter 2 is all about endurance, and endurance is a hard call. It's a hard one, right? Nobody, it's not the most exciting thing to be told. You, you need to do something very hard for a very long time, even if you don't see immediate results. Like, you're not ever going to hear that rah-rah speech, right? But after three examples of endurance, right, Paul knew that Timothy would need inspired, pointing him to the, to the soldier and, and the athlete and the farmer. And so brilliantly, right after those, he, he refocuses Timothy where we should all be focused. And it starts in verse 8 by him just saying this, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, Timothy. And it reminded me immediately of a passage in Hebrews 12 because this concept of endurance is one that runs throughout the New Testament. And the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 says this, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance in the sin that so easily ensnares us. And here's the language. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. How? Exact same way as in 2 Timothy 2, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Here in 2 Timothy 2, Paul tells Timothy, run your race with endurance. Here's three examples I want you to consider. You need endurance. And then he employs the exact same strategy that the author of Hebrews employed. Remember Jesus Christ. Look to him. Look to his example. And so there's, there's, there's several things that we could do with these three verses. But there are three specific things that Paul mentions about Jesus that I, that I want us to zoom in on today. And the first is simply this. He tells him to remember Jesus risen from the dead. Look at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David, according to my gospel. Now, the question I want to ask you is this. If Paul's going to hand Timothy three things to remember about Jesus right after this call to endurance, why would he start with this one? Why why does he lead off with, you need to remember Jesus, risen from the dead? Well, if you have 2 Timothy open, look with me back in chapter 1 at verse 8, because I want to point out to you that when we go through a book like this and we go one, two, three verses at a time, it's been weeks since we've looked at chapter 1, verse 8. But this was a letter that Timothy received. So when he got it, he read chapter 1, verse 8, and about 30 seconds later, he's reading the passage we're reading today. And so this is still in his head, right? So chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says this. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. So when Paul writes this letter, he's, he's bound in chains as a prisoner in Rome, and we know now that he's never going to be released, and he's eventually going to be executed. And if you're Timothy, I want you to imagine receiving this letter and how you would read some of this. Right? Because if you're Timothy, no one has invested in you more than Paul has invested in you. And Paul's goal was to replicate himself in Timothy. That Timothy would follow his footsteps, that Timothy would live a life like Paul lived, that Timothy would serve the Lord in the same way that Paul did, that Timothy would plant churches and spread the gospel the same way Paul did. And so if you're Timothy, think about this, you have modeled much of your life and your ministry, you've modeled all your adulthood after Paul, and now you see where it's taken Paul. Wouldn't you ask the question, wait, is that where I'm headed? Like, it's, this is the guy I'm following, and, and, and am I headed to suffering? Am I headed to imprisonment? Am I headed to early death? Because that sound good to anybody here? And so the very first thing that Paul wants Timothy to remember about Jesus is this, that Jesus Christ has defeated death itself. John Hust was a, was a priest who, 100 years before Martin Luther came on the scene, led a, led a charge for the church to be reformed. And his two big points of emphasis that, were, uh, that, were, that got him in so much trouble is that the Bible is perfect and without errors, and it has authority in all matters. And these two beliefs, which we hold to here, by the way, got him excommunicated from the church, got him exiled, got him arrested, and got him eventually killed. And at the age of 42 in Constance, Germany, he was tied to a stake, and before they, get, before they lit the fire, he was given one last, last chance to renounce his belief in Christ and in his word. And he refused, and his last words before he died were this, what I taught with my lips, I will now seal with my own blood. And my question is this, what gets someone to that point? 
What gets someone to follow the long road of endurance to the point where they're willing to give up even their life? Where, where, where do they get to where they don't even fear death itself? What gets them there is that their faith is in the one who defeated death. Jesus makes this ridiculous claim in Matthew 10, which is totally true, but I, I want you to think about hearing this for the first time as he's here. In Matthew 10, especially this first part where he says, don't fear those who kill the body. I mean, just think about that. Just don't fear them. Don't fear those who can kill you but are not able to cure the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And I love that statement from Jesus. It, 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 the, what he's implying is this. Don't fear those who can only kill you. Like, it's not that big a deal, right? But a closer look at it tells you this. In, in Jesus' eternal view, it's actually not that big a deal right? because that's all they can do. But God has the power to end your life and his wrath can be poured out for you on you for all eternity in hell. That's a much bigger problem than someone just killing your body. God also has the ability to save your soul forever. He made a way to do so through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if you admit to God that you are a sinner and you surrender your life to Jesus and trust in his death and resurrection to forgive and save you, you need not ever fear death again. Because his death acts as a payment for yours, and his resurrection acts as a promise for your resurrection. The same Jesus who rose from the dead will raise you to eternal life in heaven with him. And so why wouldn't Paul start here? Because in Jesus, we have both an example of one who endured what God called him to do all the way to death on the cross. And in Jesus, we have an answer and hope in the face of even death. That for his followers, death is not the end. I remember the first job I ever had, I, was, I think I was 13 when I started. And, I, and even in like the interview process, okay, and, and in Clo- if I'm from Cloverdale, 13, you're old enough to have a job, right? You know, by that point, you should be farming 10 fields, okay? But even in the interview process, right, the, the, the guy that was going to be my boss just kept hounding me again and again and again. The most important thing is reliability. I need to know that you're going to be here when your shift starts. I need to know you're going to stay here till your shift ends. You have to be here. You have to, you have to be counted on to show up every day. And I, so I took to this. But even at a young age, I quickly realized something. The reason he was so big on me being reliable is because he was planning on not being. That he was going to disappear for hours of time. There were going to be entire days that he just wouldn't show up and not do his job because he could count on me to be there to do it. And I got to be honest, it kind of soured the whole reliability talk for me, right? But I pointed out to tell you this. Paul is reminding Timothy, and I want you to know this about him, that in Jesus Christ, we have a king, we have a Lord who never asks us to do anything that he hasn't already done for us. Do you understand that's the power behind his invitation? His invitation to us is follow me. Follow. Not go out in front and do all the things that I don't want to do. Follow me. Follow the path that I've already cleared. Follow the path that I've already walked for you. There's nothing in this word that Jesus calls us to that he hasn't already done for us. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe Timothy's life is going to end in arrest and an early death. Maybe it would go the way that Timothy's fearing. But if, even if that happened, if he looked closely, he would see Jesus' footprints on that path. And at the end of it, Jesus would have an answer for all of it through his resurrection. So remember Jesus, Timothy. Remember Jesus risen from the dead. And remember Jesus whose word is not bound. Look again at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffered to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. I love that. I want you to think of this. Even as Paul wrote this letter, he's going to be reminded again and again and again of his chains. Like every movement of his arms, every shift of his posture, every flipping of the page, the chains would rattle, remi- giving him an audible reminder every time of how bound and unfree he was, which makes the sentiment all the more powerful. The gospel that he writes, for which I suffer and am being bound like a criminal, that's his current reality. But listen to the hope that comes right after that. But the word of God is not bound. You know what he's saying? They can tie me up. They can put me in jail and throw away the key. They can isolate me from all others. They can kill me if they want. But the seeds of gospel truth that have been planted, the investment I've made in others, the seeds of multiplication that have been sown, they are unstoppable. You cannot contain them because God is involved. This truth goes all the way back to the Old Testament. We see in Isaiah 55, God is prophesying through Isaiah, and he says that my word that comes from my mouth, and listen to this promise, will not return to me empty. 
but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. All the way in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 4, the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the question I want us to think about is this, is what is it that, that helps someone endure? What is it that keeps someone going in a long, long, hard path of obedience? The most powerful thing is this. The most powerful thing is knowing that what they do actually matters. That's what helps. And Paul is telling Timothy here, by sowing the seeds of the gospel, by spreading the word of God, you are doing what matters. In fact, it's guaranteed to matter. This is just like he told the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 15. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast and immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord, listen to this promise, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I've, I've thought about this, and I can't imagine anything worse than the idea of suffering pointlessly. The idea of, of sort of uh, suffering or cost or endurance, all for something that means nothing. Right? Giving your life or time or effort or health or youth or passion to something that ends up not mattering at all. I, I just can't think of anything emptier than that. Two, uh, two weeks ago from today, the Super Bowl was played. I'm sure if you made it, if you made it through uh, all the overrated commercials in the halftime show, then you watched into the fourth quarter, you watched the Rams uh, beat the Cincinnati Bengals on a late touchdown pass. And if there are any Bengals fans that this uh, is bringing up hard memories for, I apologize to all 11 of you out there who <laughs> I've never met one, right? But if there are, you know. And, and what it was, was that this pass was what they call a timing route, which means that the quarterback threw the pass before the receiver even turned uh, to look at it. And so when he turned, the ball was already on him. He had to catch it. And it looks incredibly easy when done right, and it's super, super hard. Like if two of us just tried to do it today, it would take us forever to get it right. And afterwards, they interviewed Cooper Cup, who was the receiver who caught this pass, and, and they asked him about it. And he said he estimated that he and Matthew Stafford, the quarterback, had spent 500 hours in the past year working just on timing routes. 500 hours. In which I thought two things immediately. Number one, that is impressive, tremendous dedication, right? And number two is this. What if they hadn't won? What if they would have been like the other 31 teams that didn't? How would they have viewed those 500 hours then? Because as impressive as it is, they, they were working towards something that wasn't guaranteed. And what Paul tells Timothy, when he tells him that the word of God is not bound, he's telling them, if you endure for the right mission, if you sow the right seeds, if you stay faithful to what I've called you to, you cannot lose. You can't. Because you're joining God, because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Man, I, I'm, I'm going to throw myself in this. I'm betting that there are multiple things that I've done in the last week, month, or year, and you're all including this, that we have put our heart to, our time to, our attention to, our money to, that ended up being pointless. Ended up being totally in vain. But anything we've done for the Lord is not in vain. It's the only thing in life that has that promise. So remember Jesus risen from the dead. Remember Jesus whose word is not bound. And remember Jesus, he points out in verse 10, in whom salvation is in his name. Look what he says in verse 10. So about nine verses he's been calling Timothy to endure, and now he gets personal. Timothy, this is why I endure. This is why I endure all the things, all things for the elect, so they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So why is Paul not second-guessing his life when he's in chains and about to die? Why does he endure all sorts of suffering for the elect and for the church? Because of the stakes. Because of the stakes. Because salvation is on the line, and salvation is found in the name of Jesus and in the name of Jesus Christ alone. It's like Peter told the Sanhedrin in Acts 4, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Why is salvation only in Jesus? Because only Jesus endured what is necessary to save us. We quoted Hebrews 12 earlier, and we're going to continue on in that verse, right? That we run our race with endurance, keeping our eyes on Jesus, and here's what it tells us. Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. Do you hear the language again? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what you need to understand. When Jesus claims in John 14 that when he says, I am the way, 
I am the truth and I'm the life, and nobody, no one comes to the Father but through me. That is not an egotistical, self-serving, self-seeking claim. It is a recognition of an inarguable truth. Because I would challenge you today to go ahead and search all of history and find all the people who meet these requirements. Find everybody for me who is God in human flesh. Find everybody for me who lived a sinless life. Find everybody for me who, who went to an excruciating death, though completely innocent on their own. Find everybody for me whose death served to pay the price for our sin. Find everybody for me who three days later defeated death itself. And therefore, you can get that list together. And when they say that they can forgive your sins and they can reconcile you to God and they can save your soul and give you eternal life, they actually have the receipts and are capable of doing so. And the list of everybody who meets all those qualifications begins and ends with Jesus Christ. It's him and it's him alone. And Paul is reminding Timothy, remember Jesus, Timothy, because salvation is in his name and his name only. Remember that you have what people need more than anything. And so why endure? Why share in suffering? Why give some of your hard-earned money to something other than yourself? Why share your faith when you could be ridiculed or rejected? Why love people who may not love you back? Why stand for truth when you could be despised? Why pray for non-believers when you've got enough problems going on? Why go overseas when there are enough needs here? Why, why serve and be the light of Jesus wherever he puts you locally? Why endure? Why not choose comfort first? Why not make self-preservation your God? Why not choose ease? Why? Because people matter, that's why. They matter deeply to God. And he has paid a steep, steep price in order to make salvation available in the name of Jesus Christ. And he is inviting us into the most incredible mission the world has ever seen, that we get to join him and play our part in his work of saving souls. What else would you ever want to give yourself to than that? What other goals could you have in this life that would be more meaningful than that? What could there be? And so remember Jesus Christ, Timothy. Remember Jesus risen from the dead. Remember Jesus whose word is not bound. Remember Jesus in whom salvation is in his name and no other name. Remember Jesus and you will never forget why endurance matters. Remember him and you'll never forget why your efforts and your faithfulness and your seeds of love and truth and service and humility and the seeds of the gospel matter. So there are two different groups that I want to challenge today with a response. And the first is those who just simply have not yet believed in Jesus Christ. And, and my challenge simply is that, to believe in Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to consider anew just what you've heard about him just today. That Jesus, as God in human flesh, came and died to pay the price that you owe God for the sins and the wrong things that you have done. That there is a punishment that you deserve to pay. And he stepped in and took it. And then he defeated death, rising again to offer you eternal life in heaven with him. And his power is unchecked, his word is not bound, and nobody else can save you, only he can. And so if your trust is in anything other than Jesus, you have a major, major problem. That You are still in your sin, and you still owe God a debt. And if that debt is not paid, it will be paid in hell for all eternity. That is really bad news. But the really great news is this that Jesus has already made a way for you. He's made a way for you to avoid that fate. He's made a way for you to have your sins forgiven and your prize played. You simply need to believe in his name. You need to trust in his death and resurrection and nothing else to save you and surrender your life to him. I challenge, I, no, I plead with you today to do so. But the second group I want to talk to is those who have already done that. And how we should respond to this is twofold. I think we, we need to ask the Lord to grant us, to give us endurance. Hopefully by now you see that nothing that God calls us to is easy. There's almost nothing that he brings our way that is resolved overnight. And quite a few years ago, Pastor Adam started using a phrase that I've since just stolen and just uses my own, right? But he referred to our walks with Jesus as a daily grind of Christian living. And I like that because it's not a sprint, it's not a burst, it's a daily grind. It's a lifetime of consistent, steady, faithful service. It's a lifetime of consistent, steady, faithful pursuit of Jesus. And last week he taught us in verse 5 in which Paul uses an athlete who competes uh, by the rules uh, as an example of endurance. And, and um, in studying that I found a race that the Greeks had in their Olympic games that was unique and, and, it, and it caught my attention. 
Right? They, they had uh, all different races in the Olympics, like, like every other race you would imagine, that the first runner across the line would win. But in this one race, they, the runners would run a race with torches lit, and the, the first one across the line wasn't the winner. It was the first one who crossed the line with their torch still lit. And that, that meant something to me, because I'm going to be honest with you. I'm growing increasingly weary of short bursts of excitement and service to the Lord that quickly flame out and lose their momentum. In my own life, I'm, I'm tired of, of this pattern of quote unquote being on fire for God for a season, followed by seasons of spiritual drought. Instead, what I want to see the Lord build in me and in this place is to find, find in me somebody who's in this for the long haul who will lean into the hard seasons and endure suffering and cost, whose hands will stay to the plow even if the harvest isn't yet, yet visible, whose fire isn't sustained by emotion or the applause of people or ease and comfort, but whose torch remains lit by a steadfast trust in the boundless word of God and the unstoppable gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that God is raising up a people here, a church here, a body here in this congregation that will keep moving towards the darkness, keep moving towards the unknown with our torches still lit for the glory of God wherever he takes us. Ask the Lord to give you this heart for endurance, this long obedience in the same direction. And then it'd be silly to look at this passage and not encourage you to do this. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus, because with Jesus, the battle is never over. With Jesus, our efforts are never in vain. With Jesus, our prayers are never pointless. With Jesus, our seeds are never worthless. George Mueller was a fascinating man. He's a Christian evangelist, pastor, and teacher. He also started an orphanage. He ended up caring for over 10,000 orphans in his lifetime in Britain. I mean, we could use his life story to tell about 13,000 different sermon stories. Just, it's, it's filled with one remarkable story of his faithfulness to the Lord and God's faithfulness to him. But one story I found this week that, that really excited me is that uh, sometime in, earlier in his life, he began praying for five of his friends to come to know Jesus. He had a burden for five of his friends. He really wanted them to know the Lord. And after several months, one of them actually did. They, they came to know, they trusted in Jesus for salvation. And so he kept praying for the other four. And two years later, two others did the same. Right? And then, so three of the five have now done it. He keeps praying 25 years pass, and then the fourth friend came, comes to Christ. And Mueller preserved in prayer for his fifth friend for 52 years until he died, with that friend never giving his life to Jesus. But shortly after his funeral, that fifth friend accepted Christ. And I wonder, I wonder when God looks at me or my family, I wonder when he looks at you, he looks at this church and this body, does he see that type of endurance? Are we willing to stay at it? Are we resolved to, to not grow weary of doing good? Will we pursue multiplication and, and, and gospel, the spread of the gospel until the Lord calls us home? Will we be his hands and feet even when it's hard for us? Or will we choose ease and comfort? Will we give our passion to a lesser mission? Will we retire from serving God and coast out our final days? Will we take the salvation and just pass on the endurance? Will we give in when the mission feels too hard or ask for too much or comes for one of our idols? Or will we remember Jesus? When you've had that friend that you've prayed for, you've shared the gospel with for years, that you've, you've done all kinds of acts and service and love for, and, and you wonder if this, is this ever going to result in anything. Will you remember Jesus and be encouraged by the power of his gospel and that nothing's impossible for him? There are few things in this life more exhausting than parenting, especially if you're a stay-at-home parent. You never clock out, rarely get things. There's no means of advancement. It's just emptying your bucket day after day after day after day. And so it's so easy to get discouraged, so easy to wish for a different season of life, so easy to feel like you're always on the sidelines. Or if your parent goes to work, it's so easy to come home tired and just pass on all the most important aspects of parenting to some future day when you'll have more energy as if that day will ever come. But will you remember Jesus and the heart that he has for kids, even your kids, and how nothing in life is more important than your kids' hearts belonging to Christ? And let that birth in you an endurance to get through the harder and lonelier seasons and keep pointing your children to the truth of Christ, even when it feels like they're not listening. 
ministry leaders, group leaders, class leaders, is week in and week out, you prepare your lessons and your discussions. You is week in and week out, you have these opportunities to invest in people. Will you tire and fade out when, when you don't see immediate results? Will you lose heart when most of the fruit of your efforts happens in places that are invisible and impossible for you to see? Or will you remember Jesus whose word is not bound and will never return to him empty? When you hear the calls from the word uh, that we are to forgive others just as the Lord forgave us, will you choose the easy path of resentment and bitterness? Or will you remember Jesus, the sinless, spotless Jesus, taking the whips and nails and cross for you who didn't deserve it at all? When God calls you or God calls us to something that's scary or hard or new or difficult, whether it's serving overseas or leading a group or ministry here, or fostering or adopting kids or sponsoring or supporting children or, or, ministry, or missionaries or doing something brand new for him, will you cower back and just choose the easier path? Or will you remember Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for you and go and pray and serve and give and say yes and head down that road of risk and cost and adventure for the glory of your Savior? I don't want to be misunderstood this morning. This isn't about being amazing for God. That's not the call. This isn't about being strong for God or capable for God or able for God as if he somehow needs us. It's about a persistent, faithful endurance for the Lord. Because every single day, God uses limited, broken, sinful, shattered, unskilled, damaged, fallible, imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. He delights in it. He does it all the time. We are the ones that don't give him the chance when we take away the opportunity. When we take away the opportunity to be used by him by refusing to enter the game or just by taking ourselves out of it. What he wants from us is to stay at it. And he will do more with your faithfulness than you could ever dream up. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ignace Jan Paderewski. Maybe you heard of him in music class in school growing up, but he was... This famous composer pianist that his fame was so renowned that he actually used it to become a prime minister of Poland. He was the one that signed the, the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And it's like, man, this guy started playing the piano and now he's in this role, right? But he was so, he, he was world round renowned. And so uh, before all that started, he, one evening he had a concert in America. And it was one of these uh, extravagant, fancy concert halls, one of these events that if you considered yourself important, considered yourself anybody, you're going to be there that night. And so the concert hall was just, it was packed an hour before the concert started. And there was a mother in the audience with a nine-year-old boy that she had been trying to teach to play piano. And she thought it would be really cool for him to come hear this world-famous pianist play. And so they got to their seats early because, you know, it was a full house. And the boy did what all nine-year-old boys do. He got restless and he got fidgety. He didn't want to wait an hour for the concert to start, and so he started getting more and more fidgety, and eventually he, he broke away from his mom, snuck away from her, ran right down the aisle, ran up to the stage, and sat down at the piano. And in, full, in front of this full concert hall, just started playing chopsticks, which is like the most basic melody you can play on the piano. And this is not what people came to see. And so people in this crowd started to get angry. They started to shout, Who's, whose boy is that? Get this boy off stage. Like, we want the concert to start, all this stuff. And backstage, Paderewski heard this. He heard the commotion. He heard the basic melody being played. He, he quickly figured out what was going on. And he grabbed his, his suit jacket, threw it on, and he, sp he literally sprinted out on the stage, didn't recognize the crowd, didn't address them, and ran right to the piano. And while the boy was playing chopsticks, he stood behind him, reached around his arms, and then started playing with him. And he improvised a counter melody that, that, that paired beautifully with this boy's really basic skills. And all of a sudden, the crowd stopped yelling, and he just kept playing with the boy, and it just made this beautiful noise. And as he was playing, he just kept whispering to the boy, don't stop playing, don't stop playing, don't quit, don't quit, I've got this. I hope you understand what Paul is telling Timothy here. I hope you understand what God in his word is telling us. You just keep playing your chopsticks. You just keep doing what, the, what limited basic things that you can do for the Lord. You keep following him in obedience, and he will reach around behind you and play along with you, and it will be beautiful. Because the results were always his. The success of the mission was always his. What he looks for from us is faithfulness. What he whispers in our ear is this. Don't stop. Just keep going. Just keep going. And if we do, it'll be beautiful. 
Let's pray. Father, I'm so incredibly grateful that in Jesus Christ, we have God, we have a Savior, we have a Lord and a King who never calls us to anything that he wasn't willing to do for us. Lord, I'm so thankful for that example of endurance, for that simple invitation. Just, just follow me. I've already walked this path. Just follow me on it. And so, Lord, I want to pray for, for two groups of people this morning specifically. I want to pray for those who, who are in, within the sound of my voice and have not given their lives to Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help them to see their need for a Savior today. We help them to see their need that as a sinner, they owe you a debt that they cannot pay on their own, but Jesus, in his love and his grace and mercy, came and paid it for them. Now, if they would just believe, they would just receive, they just surrender their life to him right now, that he will forgive all their sins based off the power of his death and will grant them eternal life based off the power of his resurrection. And Lord, where they're sitting right now, may they, may they do that. May you bring them to the point of salvation. And then, God, for the rest, I want to pray for those who are tired, for those who, who are starting to think as if their efforts for you don't matter, for those who've taken themselves out of the game, for those who, who had, a, who had a, a brilliant season of, of fervency and service to you, and now just, they're just coasting. They just don't have a passion for your mission or your church or your people anymore. God, for those who are tempted to be there, Lord, may you ignite in us an endurance. May you ignite in us a willingness and joy for long suffering. May you ignite in us a passion to just keep playing chopsticks. To just keep sowing seeds of faithfulness, not outside of our ability, just, just what we can do. That you promise to come reach around us in your grace. To take the widow's two mites and do more with it than what we could ever imagine. But would you birth in this place a body of people, a congregation who are willing to walk the long road of obedience to you. And would you do this for your glory? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship one last time.
Well, listen, thank you all very much for being here today. I'm thrilled that you uh, chose to be a part of this. We're humbled by it. If you're a guest, we're so thankful that you uh, took the time to try something new, took a risk, and we've got a gift for you. If you could stop by our Connect desk, we'd love to, to love on you before you head out. Uh, one last thing I want to mention, and we've been talking about it quite a bit, and, and many of you are taking us up on it. It's pretty exciting to see, but one of the brilliance, the brilliance of God in, in his design is he doesn't just call people to endurance. He gave them a local community to help them, right? And so one of the steps, of, one of the things endurance is, is just taking steps deeper in your faith with Christ, taking steps deeper in your service to Christ. And so if you go to our website, firstbaptistnorth.com, and click on the Go Deeper tab, what you'll find there is multiple opportunities to do it. But I, what I promise you is if you sign up for it, what you'll find is people, and army people stand there ready to, to love on you, to serve you, to, to, to develop you, to invest in you, to help you pursue Jesus more and more. And they will, they will become your community. They will become your life source. They will become the people that spur you on to endurance. And, 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 the, and they are ready for you right now. And so if, if you're ready, if you believe that uh, you need to be baptized, you believe that uh, you need to get in a group, you believe it's time to start serving, there, there are, go, to that, go to that, sign up on whatever link you want to click on, and there's people ready and waiting for you to join you in that journey. And so please take advantage of that. Uh, on your way out, do not forget the love offering for the Blackwells, and please stop by them and thank them for their many years of faithful service to the Lord. Um, just be a blessing to them today, church, all right? Uh, we love you guys. Uh, you are dismissed.